Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Hope everyone out there is doing great. I am Rob Hansen with locumstory.com, which is an educational resource uh, for physicians, PAs, and NPs who want to learn about locum tenens, kind of how it works, and how it can uh, fit into their career paths. And um, I know we are all a little tired of hearing that these are unprecedented times, but the reality is these really are unprecedented times. Um, many healthcare providers have taken pay cuts, they've been furloughed, and they are starting to realize that job security just isn't what they thought it was. Uh, add to this all the anxiety and the burnout happening, and the result is a huge spike in interest in locum tenens. So that's really why we wanted to do this, uh, this webinar this morning and talk about locum tenens and uh, maybe give some advice to those who are thinking about doing it for the first time. Uh, because we really feel strongly that locum tenens can help a lot of these issues that I brought up earlier. Uh, full transparency though, their um, uh, jobs have not totally come back. Um, so there are some specialties where the volume hasn't quite recovered. Uh, we're optimistic that as um, facilities reschedule elective surgeries and patients return for deferred care, that those jobs will come back. But I just wanted to throw that caveat out there. Um, also, if you have any questions, uh, make sure you use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Uh, our team will answer questions in real time. And if we have time, we'll also ask some questions to our panelists. And speaking of our panelists here, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Pellegrini who have graciously joined us this morning. And I will let them take uh, 60 seconds to kind of just introduce themselves and maybe talk a little bit about their locums experience. We'll start with Dr. Patel. Um, hey, um, so I started on a staff job in Houston um, five, six years ago, and then I do part-time academics here in Houston at the uh, Baylor College of Medicine. And then um, I started branching out a little bit of locums in Texas and then branched out to a few more states. And so I kind of made locums into a full-time practice. And so I kind of do academics one week and then um, locums the next three weeks. And it works really well with projects and academics, doing global health projects, and just other things going on that I do related to and uh, really not related to medicine. Great, and you're uh, an emergency medicine physician. Correct, yeah, I practice emergency medicine, trained out in Philadelphia, um, and have been back here in Texas and Houston for about, yeah, about six, seven years now. Great, Dr. Pellegrini, how about you? Uh, yeah, so I do part-time locums. I started out uh, full-time employed as a trauma critical care surgeon, but after about 12 years was sort of looking for a way to not be so beholden to the absolute schedule that my work um, had. So I, I started doing just a little bit of locums. I did maybe a couple weeks the first couple of years and then um, found that I really liked it. And so I started doing more and more and so now what I have is I have a part-time job and part of my agreeing to take the job was that they give me enough time to continue to do trauma critical care locums. So I do about um, anywhere from six to 10 or 12 weeks a year of locums now. Very cool. So um, you're both doing locums. Uh, Dr. Patel, how does one get into locums? What's that process like? I think, kind of figuring out, kind of like Dr. Pellegrini was saying, like what you want out of it. Um, I was just having dinner with one of my older residents last night and it's really, do you want the experience side of it? Do you want the scheduling side of it? Do you want to kind of have the freedom to do other things with it? Um, I kind of did it for all those reasons. I like working in different areas, different pathologies, different states, um, as well as just the time. But I think starting out just seeing what you want and then contacting either word of mouth people that do it or contacting agencies who can kind of set you up and find you locations that would fit she wanted to uh, get involved with navajo nation so she does part-time academics like me and then she works uh in new mexico uh with the navajo which are going through a horrible um COVID pandemic right now so that was kind of her passion and I think locums allows her to really do that and gives them a, a mechanism to just get in, do the work, and it's their schedule as well. Great. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, physicians who are 
uh, reticent to do locums. They have some, maybe some fears about it. Maybe there's some misperceptions. Uh, Dr. Pellegrini, what was your first locums assignment like? Was, was any of that happening? You know, so I, this was where somebody called me and I just happened to pick up the phone and talk to the recruiter and took my first assignment at Carilion Clinic um, in Roanoke, Virginia. And, um, and so that was in 2012. And I obviously, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, you know, I was going to manage a neuro ICU. And it was the best experience I ever had. Um, the res I, I was in a community program with no residents and no mid-level. So always doing everything myself. And all of a sudden I was thrust into this program with residents and medical students and being able to teach and finding that I had this passion for teaching and then actually um, running into people that I knew from my, my research days. And um, I mean, just really had a fantastic time. It was such a good fit that they tried to hire me, but, and they were trying to figure out how to get me, you know, approved to work week on week off. Cause through all of my stories, I've, I've always refused to leave Maine. So everyone has to work around the fact that I need to get back here. So it was a great experience. And it all started off with a phone call that I just happened to answer and got a recruiter who just happened to be chatty enough. And I happened to be in a good mood and we clicked. That's awesome. Yeah. How about you, how about you Dr. Patel? First, first assignment, what was that like? God, I think my first assignment was on the border town in um, Texas. Um, and I really had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> um, but I loved it. I'd never really been single coverage. I'd never done 12 hours single coverage. I wasn't really that far out of residency. So it was a real challenge. And I don't really know I thought it through totally. But <laughs> But um, I absolutely loved it. I loved going to a part of my state that really needed kind of board trained or certified providers. And really our specialists out there were lacking so much. So feeling so useful and really getting to work with, um, you know, we're, we have a large Hispanic Latino population here in Texas. So I'm getting to work with populations there as well as the border town populations of people crossing and things like that and all the issues that brings was um, really, really outstanding. I had a wonderful experience. Yeah, I didn't have anything, uh, anything wrong, really. I loved it. Oh, that's great. Uh, you kind of both talked a little bit about your backgrounds. Um, Dr. Patel doing kind of border medicine and rural, rural um, practicing in rural communities. I know Dr. Pellegrini uh, goes to Alaska a lot, uh, which is her home state to do locums. What's that like kind of going back home to do locums? You know, that was actually good. I did locums in the, um, Indian Health Service at the Alaska Native Medical Center, which is where my father used to be um, a vascular surgeon. So it was a little bit like old home week. Um, every once in a while, having some of the older nurses come up and tell me what it was like to work with them. And then um, doing a horrible abdominal aortic trauma case in the middle of the night. And one of the nurses saying, well, we need Dr. Dietz's instrument. And that was my maiden name. And I'm like, what you, you what's that you know, it was like the absolute perfect instrument that i needed um so you know that was just a great experience it, it, i do think it's probably the longest commute i ever had and i did it for about six weeks so i would go up and work one or two weeks and then fly back to maine for you know somewhere between three and five weeks um and i'm kind of grateful that i'm not doing it now i honestly don't think that i'd be able to fly. I mean, Alaska is not allowing anyone to fly in. So I'm kind of grateful that that's not, wasn't part of my schedule right now. Yeah, that, that is definitely a long commute. I know Dr. Patel has told me that uh, he likes to take assignments where uh, there are no connecting flights, just a nice direct flight. Yeah, it's uh, a while <laughs> to figure out how to travel, but I think I've been happiest. I don't mind the travel, but I think if there's a direct flight and then maybe not too far away from the airport, like an hour and a half, two hours is, is doable. It gives me time to do podcasts and audio books. But I mean, if I'm driving seven, eight hours, it might be, uh, <laughs> might be just a little bit too much these days as I'm getting older. <laughs> yeah, well, those, are, those, are, those are great travel tips. Uh, any, any tips you have, uh, Dr. Pellegrini? 
Well, yeah, so obviously when I first started, um, I wasn't, uh, you know, with the commute to Alaska, but every, because I live in Bangor, Maine, almost everything, every locums is a, is a flight for me unless it happens to be in Mass Massachusetts. Um, and so I had learned how to always pack as if I was going to spend the night in an airport. Um, I always have my bag with me that has, you know, snacks and my iPad. I finally splurged after a few years for the Delta Lounge membership, which let me tell you, that was awesome. <laughs> and then I can tell you almost every major airport, at least between here and Alaska, where the secret sleeping area is. There's a secret spot in every airport where you can, you know, blow up your little pillow and pull out your little airplane blanket and, you know, nap. Now, of course, it helps that I'm like five feet two in heels. Um, so I, and I figured out where all the good places were to eat, where the good places were to rest. So I made the commute to Alaska, which was um, about 18 hours for me uh, each way. I, I figured out a way to make it sort of my Zen moment. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is if you're used, you know, Dr. Patel working in the ER might not understand this as much as us surgeons. If you're used to carrying a pager and then always having to be available, even when you're at home or no matter, you know, you're out on a run, the nice thing about flying is nobody could get a hold of me. It was awesome for 18 hours. Incommunicado. Loved it. <laughs> that, that, is, that is nice. Uh, I've heard physicians say that one of the nice things about doing locums is you don't have that pager. You know, you're not, you know, uh, I guess on call at time and have somebody uh, after you for 24 seven. Um, Dr. Patel, uh, I know you do, uh, you sometimes go work with an agency, sometimes you go direct. Um, what, what do you think, what are some of the benefits of using an agency? And we had somebody, uh, one of our participants asked, um, is it best to limit yourself to being credentialed to just one or two locums agencies or more? What are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I always say like starting out, I think it's uh, great to start with an agency and see how you like it. I think it depends on what, how you incorporate locums like into your lifestyle. If you think you're gonna do it full time like me, um, you start getting kind of locations where they just kind of contact you directly. Um, whereas if you think you're just gonna do it part time, um, agencies just offer a lot with travel, with location, assignments, making sure everything is up to snuff when you actually start on your shift. Um, so I, I don't know, I've had good experiences with both. Um, I do think that a lot of hospitals, when you're with agencies, they want to start trying to get perm staff if they can. Though some hospitals have, um, I work at a hospital in New Mexico where their model is always to use locums. And so it's never been an issue. Um, but some of them want to do perm staff. So the only caveat I think is when that assignment can, they get staffed up. But then I found when they staffed up, then they have fluctuations and they end up calling you back. But if you make more, if you gravitate more towards doing more locums work, it's not a bad idea to have a few options just in case one place fills up temporarily um, and they may not need you. So the, the, the beauty I think of doing it is you get real freedom in your lifestyle and kind of how you wanna um, live, your, live your life. But at the same time, they may not sometimes need you if they have fluctuations in staffing or things like that, so. Dr. Pellegrini, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on how many agencies would you work with at a time? What's kind of optimal there? Um, you know, honestly, I think just one or two um, is probably the way to go. I, I think if you're doing your first locums assignment, go, do, going through one of the major agencies is the way to go. They, um, they're going to help you get licensed and credentialed. They know exactly the paperwork that needs to be done. And then once you've gotten credentialed with that agency they now have all your paperwork um and so and then i think once you get a whole bunch of agencies the question is um you know there's only so much you want to work i mean you know it's only so many weeks in a year and so you start to dilute it out um now that said i think some agencies have more of a type of job than others and so um you know i i tend to do most of my critical care through one company, but my trauma through another. Um, and then like Dr. Patel, um, I, I meet people and do a lot of independent contracting because when I go and give a good service and somebody will see my name and then they'll say, hey, will you cover our hospital 
street and you know you know so it, it you kind of start people people if they like you will call you back um or somebody else will bring you in so you you but i wouldn't start out that way i think start out with a one of the major agencies that can kind of help you and also guide you as to whether there's red flags in your background things that you might need to take care of uh, before you start uh, doing a locums and and you know there's a fair number of physicians i think that have um, some red flags that, that they can fix they just need to fix them and then they're fine yeah that's a really good point i think um i think to dr pelgrim's point like going with an agency too that is experienced or having an agent that is experienced um i think makes a world of difference because i think a lot of people that go into it are confused because there's so many agencies out there. At our national conference, you just see all these boots. And so I think whoever you go with, whatever agency it is, talking to them, what is their experience like? Do they have experience with emergency, with surgery, critical care, and can they kind of assist you? And even sometimes um, talking to some of their client physicians, how was your experience with X agent? How was their credentialing? How did the pay work? Was the site what they said it was? Um, I think really facilitates um, you starting. I know on the ER side, hospitals can be a little hesitant starting with people that may not have experience because for us, just like I'm sure for surgery, you literally jump in, learn the EMR, meet new staff, and you just have to be able to get along, navigate the waters, kind of go with the flow and um, just make things work <laughs> and not complain about it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just a follow-up question. So somebody asked, uh, what are some red flags? Could you give some examples? Yeah, uh, I did see that. So a couple of red flags that um, I've seen people have. So one is somebody's been out of work for a while, either due to illness or family issues or, you know, whatever. Um, how are they going to get back in? A lot, of, um, a lot of hospitals won't credential you if you've not been working for three months. So you're your agency can maybe send you to a place that's maybe a little needier, as we say, and you can kind of get your feet wet that way. Um, have you had lawsuits? Uh, big payouts are a big are, are kind of a big deal, but it's not it's not a non-starter. They just need to help you um, get through that. Um, or or have you had a whole bunch of lawsuits? What's the issue behind it? Um, have you had to seek uh, drug and alcohol treatment? That's not a non-starter people have been able to get jobs and locums assignments, but they got to have a really good um, fix. Hopefully it's something that got fixed and they've got all the documentation and answers for it. Um, another thing is your own health problems. You may have health problems such that you can't take certain jobs. It'd be nice to not even be presented to those. So um, I'm trying to think, I think those are probably the only red flags that I can think of right now. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And I think those are things that having a good relationship with your recruiter can really, can really help. Uh, another well, question. Oh, go yeah, ahead. I mean to interrupt, but I think it's very important if you're brand new into this, that um, when you're first meeting your recruiter, you come right out and ask your recruiter how long they've been doing this. Um, how much experience do they have? Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I think the really important big companies don't stick brand new people that don't even know the language on the phone recruiting you. And I had a really interesting experience with this when my youngest daughter graduated from college a couple of years ago uh, and took, I, I won't say company, but got hired by a locums company and was immediately on the phone trying to recruit physicians. But even though she grew up with one, she never paid any attention to anything I did. So she didn't know anything. And then she would have to call me and, and say, hey, mom, um, is X procedure considered bread and butter general surgery? I mean, just things like that. Um, and I felt like that was just a setup for failure. So all those poor physicians that got her, I mean, I love my daughter, but honestly, how the heck was she going to get them into a job? Because she barely even had life figured out of her job. So yeah, I think it, it, you don't need something. 15 years, I mean, you know, just a couple of years or, or at least some mentoring so that you're talking to somebody that actually knows what it's going to take to get you lined up with a job. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, not all agencies are created equal. Um, 
you know, some, some do more training. Also, I think you mentioned earlier about different specialties. Some are deeper in different specialties than other. Others, some are a little more regional focused, so definitely do some research. Um, we've got some good information on locumstory.com about different agencies that, uh, that you can check out. Um, we had another question come in. Uh, as a 1099 independent contractor, uh, it looks like one of, uh, one of our uh, attendees just did their first locums assignment and realized that paychecks um, don't have income tax and social security deducted. How do you handle that? Maybe Dr. Patel, you can take a stab at that one. I am going to plead that I have a bookkeeper and an accountant who manage all that. And I'm embarrassed to say I know a little bit about it, but I know it gets a little dodgy because I work in, and I've had this question come up about, you know, multiple other states and do you file income tax in that state? Do you not? Is it based on residence? Is it based on how much you make? Um, I think it gets tricky. And I think uh, I encourage everybody to learn. Um, shame on me for not knowing the answer to that. But um, I have, uh, my, my father is a physician and he has a very excellent bookkeeper and accountant company who um, I think sat down and sort of explained sort of how things work. And so I would defer to them. It'd be like in my house, which I don't even try to fix anything here because I'm not an expert. And my handyman is like, look, I don't, I don't do any crazy procedures on myself. Let me fix your home. And then you take care of me when I'm sick. <laughs> so uh, I encourage people to learn. But if you can find somebody trusted and talk to your colleagues, because it does get tricky if you open a lot of different states. Um, but I do quarterlies. I do quarterly uh, payroll. And so briefly, um, I'll get my salary will come in each month. My bookkeeper will look at me. We'll talk about how much we want to give out to tax a certain amount every four months. And then I do all the filings with my CPA company. And so that's been about it. And it's worked out pretty well, but it does get confusing. Anything to add, Dr. Pellegrini? Um, no, I think it's it's pretty important. To, if, if you like finances, fine, you'll learn how to do it. If you don't, then hire somebody. It becomes very important. Um, as an independent contractor, you also have to pay your share of Social Security taxes. So that's 3% that an employed physician doesn't have to pay. Um, you do have to file taxes in pretty much every state. Um, I occasionally will ignore a few states, the ones that I know that don't tend to come after me and I didn't work much, but you kind of learn that. Um, I, you know, we buy the, uh, the multi-state turbo tax, um, and you know, you're going to need that if you're going to work in multiple states. The other question I get asked a lot about is whether somebody should be an LLC and I have not found any benefit to that whatsoever. I think it depends on the state you live in. I did give a talk um, in Snowbird on kind of some of the financial implications of being a locums. And it really comes down to knowing your state's rules, the state where you live, not where you're working. Um, and then the other thing that I think people, if they're gonna go full time, need to understand the health insurance issue. So I happen to live in a state that has no health insurance if you're not through an employer. It was a big deal here in Maine. If you live somewhere on the exchange, then you have it easier. But just know whether your state's on the exchange or not, or you may be kind of up Ships Creek without health insurance. Yeah, I want to like add, it's a really good point. Um, you also get a lot of benefits being an independent contractor from being an employee. I have my own insurance as well. Um, but a lot of things that you do from travel to rental cars to um, everything related to your travel and your work ends up being tax deductions. Um, which I think works out really favorably in the end for me. Um, so, um, and then I'll just tag on to you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm over 55, so I can do the catch up. And as an independent contractor, I can put way more into retirement, um, yeah, good point. more than twice as much as if, as an, um, as an employee. So, and, and I can do, I can choose because I happen to have both. I have an employee, but I'm also an independent contractor. And so depending on where you are financially, it might make sense to take advantage of putting more in. You can't do both. So you might lose your employer match, but if your employer doesn't match much, then it's not much of a loss. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Uh, we had another question come in and just, Again, in the spirit of transparency, locumstore.com uh, is, uh, is funded by CHG Healthcare, which owns some locum agencies. But we try to be, uh, we try to be uh, neutral and just try to focus on locums education. But 
Uh, do you have any agencies that you work with that you would recommend? That's uh, one of our, our questions that came in. Um, I work uh, only really with Comp Health, uh, which is a part of CHG. Um, I've been with the same agent now for um, about six, seven years now, I think. Um, and uh, I, I was working a little bit with Weatherby. Uh, I think there were just ups and downs on the market of availability and what locums needs were. Um, I've worked in the past with, uh, actually, I think once you start for emergency, you're on everybody's call list. And especially if you do a lot of locums, you're on everybody's call list. Um, so I get called a lot by staff care. I had a great experience with them in New Orleans. We were working at Oster. Um, and I've worked with Mint before. And um, like I said, it's really been, I haven't really had any negative experience. There's always little hangups about credentialing here, licensing there, paperwork this. But I mean, you have to remember in the end, agencies are kind of working with you um, to facilitate you. And I mean, that's, that's how they get paid as well. So they have a financial incentive to also assist you, but they're really there to assist you to give you a good working environment so that you're happy and they're happy and everybody can, you know, can uh, and be happy together, so. Great, Any, anything to add to that, Dr. Pellegrini? Um, yeah, I mean, I only work uh, with Weatherby and Comp Health right now. I started with Locum Tenants and had a great experience um, and actually did um, one other job with them last year, um, but unfortunately it only was one weekend. Um, and, and then, you know, I think, I think I learned the hard way not to go with a company I didn't know because back in March I had a company, it was one of the bigger names, call me saying, hey, we can get you emergency credentialed like within a couple of days for this hospital in Massachusetts for COVID. And so I went and talked to my partners. I switched my whole schedule around, got everything all set, and they, they just never got the ball rolling. And so, I mean, you know, the worst thing that happened is I got to sit at home um, and get all my home projects done for a week because I'd arranged for a whole week off with nothing to do. Um, so not exactly a bad idea. Um, so I pretty much have just said, you know what, I got a great relationship with Weatherby and Comp Health and my two recruiters. I'm just going to stick with them. Um, Weatherby does more of sort of the critical care for me and Comp Health more of the trauma. And honestly, it works fine. I think some of the hiccups I've had in the past have been, I started at a hospital where the agency hadn't done my DEA properly. And so that was a nightmare because it took a week or two to write prescriptions. And I forgot how it worked in the state where I, my PA was able to write them for me. Um, I've had one situation, um, <laughs> it's actually gonna be in Maine, um, where this is a long time ago. And um, they, I'd done the license actually, started through it, I'd set off all my days and then um, the la and this was no fault of the agency. It was the hospital. The medical director last minute just pulled the plug on it. And I think, you know, maybe we should have secured those days in some written contract so my shifts couldn't get pulled because that was over a lot of weeks of work um, in over a three, four month period um, where, you know, and then I had a, a past issue where I wasn't being reimbursed properly. I was doing, I do mainly Airbnbs and I stay in houses and you submit your reimbursement. So if the agency doesn't have a robust kind of online way of tracking like apps like Concur and stuff like that, where you can literally submit the receipt and then see yourself get reimbursed, um, but it's not transparent, then it becomes a real issue and <laughs> it gets you kind of angry. So um, just prior, prior issues, never anything on shift. I know a lot of people talk about for emergency, walking into like disasters, um, that's never happened to me. Uh, most of my places I've worked have been really good. And I always talk to positions that work there before I go to, um, to iron out issues I may have with the hospital and why they really need us there. Yeah, thank you. Um, somebody asked about um, average assignment length. I know it's very different from specialty to specialty, but kind of for your specialties, you know, Kind of what does that range look like? Um, I, I used to do um, like four on, day off, three on, come back home. Um, I didn't like being away from home that long. And now that I bought a home, I really like being at home more. 
Um, so now I'll try to do three to four day stretches. So I'll try to fly out Sunday, Monday, do the stretch during the week and then try to fly back home. And I found uh, for emergency, there's everybody has a limit. Um, I think when we're doing 12s, um, it, there's a certain limit for me. Some people have seven, some six. I'm a four to five guy. After four to five shifts, my productivity burnout just starts to get high. And so um, that's about it for me. And I come back home. And then um, weeks where I am kind of have stuff planned, I'm you know, basically just tell the hospitals that we're not available for coverage. What's you, Dr. Pellegrini? Um, trauma is typically seven days, and it's, um, it's either a 24 on, 24 off. And now that I've hit my age, I try to avoid those ones. Um, or seven twelves, and it can be a day or a night, and I, I don't care. I like both of them. Uh, the only problem, I think, is most hospitals and most trauma teams like to do a Monday to Monday. And I've tried to tell them that if they did a Tuesday to a Tuesday or a Friday to a Friday, they'd get more people because – when you have to commute from, like for me, I ruined two weekends. I, I ruined the Sunday before flying out and then the, the whole weekend that I'm working for. For critical care, um, as an independent, so I'd say when I'm working for whether it be a comp health, that's a week. But as an independent contractor in like Massachusetts, and that's the only place I've ever done it, I can go down and do like four 12 hour shifts and come home. So that's really nice. Um, so typically a week. And then, you know, week on, week off is what a lot of hospitals are looking for. Or um, the other, I think, most common schedule would be week on a month. So can you give them one week a month ongoing? Great. And, and for those participants that are in other specialties, you can go to locumstory.com. And we have this really cool tool where you can look at your specialty and you can see what average assignment links look like. You can see average pay rates. Uh, you can see some other information about your specialty, so definitely check that out. Uh, we've got a couple more questions that came in. Um, how difficult is the credentialing and recredentialing process? Maybe Dr. Patel can tackle that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I started, it, I just, again, I didn't really know how to go about doing it. And um, I have a, a Google Drive, probably like most people, or some online cloud, and I have everything scanned, alphabetized. And so whenever they need the forms, basically, um, most of the, the nice thing about agencies is everything will get pre-filled for you. And so literally just, I notify them, just put on the stickies where I need to sign or fill in. They mail, they FedEx the packet to me. I will pretty much give them access to my Google Drive, which has all of my, my MD certificates, my board certifications, whatever. And that's pretty much it. Um, I know the, the bane of all of our existences is the, the, the references and getting people to do references, especially if you work a lot of places. But I have like, um, I call them my locum soulmates and we, a whole bunch of ER docs and we work together in a couple sites. And so we kind of all use each other as our references so that, you know, it's kind of like, hey, I just got a call from uh, one of my colleagues. She's like, hey Rip, I need a reference in an hour. I'm like, it's done. <laughs> so we're just used to doing them so often. Um, but um, I have everything online. Look, the agencies will take care of the rest of it. And then same thing with my licenses. And I think if you do it that way, it's, it's a lot less painful. Um, sometimes hospitals will ask for really weird things. Um, and usually the agencies, if you guide them in the right direction, they can, I know one wanted like case logs of some hospital I'd worked at. And um, anyway, they took care of it. But barring that, it's not really that painful. That's good to hear. Anything to add, Dr. Pellegrini? No, I do exactly what Dr. Patel does. It's all, um, it's on my computer. It's also in the drive. And then I have a CV where I annotated every single assignment when I got my temp privs, when I got perm privs. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's all, so I've got it all listed in a CV and then all the documentation I've got I scanned in in some form because I also have multiple DEAs, a gazillion licenses, um, and then people want to know where you've worked. So I've got every single locums assignment listed also. Yeah, I have the same thing. So I have a CV with all of my sites and I, Texas has like a common app. And so they want you to um, know your like volume who's the medical director, uh, what's the phone number, all these just random things. So I just put it all on a CV and um, just submit it whenever, whenever they need it. So it's never, never been an issue for me. 
Mm -hmm. A little follow-up question um, from one of our attendees. Uh, speaking of references, can you use people you worked with during a prior assignment as a reference, even though it's a short assignment? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm back and forth on that one. I mean, I, I, I do so many references for people. Sometimes they want this. Sometimes they want like a leadership reference. Sometimes they want within two years. But I, in general, yeah, I don't think it's an issue at all. Cool. Here, here is a question about malpractice, everyone's favorite topic. Uh, most, uh, I guess the question is whether or not uh, locums, assi locums assignments cover malpractice with tail coverage. Yes. Yeah, yeah it does. I, don't, I don't have any problems with that. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think it's good for uh, to look into the state you're going to work in to see what the malpractice climate is like. Um, but um, yeah, I haven't had any issues, agencies will cover it. And I think even if you go about, kind of like what Dr. Pellegrini was saying about uh, word of mouth and people asking if you do a good job asking for your help, the hospitals will usually um, cover your malpractice as well, I found. I just asked them, you know, can you guys please cover it? And this will be the rate or whatever. So it hasn't been an issue. Yeah, I just want to word of caution. If you, um, so most companies uh, are buying um, the, I, I always get confused on the types of malpractice, but the one where you have to purchase a tail. So if you go with a small company, they may not have the money set aside to purchase that tail if needed. Um, so keep that in mind. The other thing is as an independent contractor, if you're going to help out a hospital that perhaps is going to be going through bankruptcy, uh, remember you will pay for the tail when they go bankrupt. That's a really good point. Great, great points. Also, uh, I think Dr. Pellegrini alluded to this, but every agency handles malpractice differently. So you just want to make sure, make sure you research that and you know what their malpractice coverage looks like because um, it differs by agency. Um, here's a question. I think Dr. Pellegrini talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, the question is just how you manage a full-time job with part-time locums. Uh, so when I was full time, I had eight weeks of vacation and I took two of those weeks and did locums each year. Now I'm considered full time, but I actually only have to work 30 weeks um, and do 122 days of call. So as long as I get those days in, the rest of the other 22 weeks a year is mine. Um, so, uh, you know, I, in fairness, that's not really full time, but it is because I'm putting the full time hours in. I just do it in 30 weeks. So if you are a standard employee, um, hopefully you get, you know, hopefully you get enough vacation. The other way is to just uh, negotiate with your hospital. A lot of them are willing to negotiate now and try to go 0.9 or 0.8. So you still keep all your full-time benefits, but you've now freed up a few weeks to do some locums, um, if that's, which you know, has its benefits, you know, allows you to get out of your hospital and learn new things and learn new ways and, you know, and keep fresh. Yeah, definitely. Um, an another question for, uh, for Dr. Pellegrini. I think the question's around surgeries. Uh, do you do elective cases? And uh, even though you're kind of in the area for a short time, I guess, I guess the question is kind of around the, post-op care and kind of how that works? So if you're going to take a general surge or a any surgical job, I think you want to know what are they looking for you for? Are you going to be doing just emergency coverage or are they going to have you do electives? And I've actually gone into places where they've had a full clinic and an elective schedule for me. Um, and which was a little odd because I knew I would, you know, what we did is those were places where I was then going to be coming back in a few weeks. So I would do my post-op visits when I came back. Um, some of them have NPs and PAs that do the follow-up, which in all honesty, that's how the follow-up with a lot of surgeons across the country is anyway, is you see the surgeon, you know, maybe one or two times and then you're seeing their PA. Um, but most importantly, if you are a surgical specialist and you're going to be doing any kind of surgery, whether it be elective or emergency, you need to not be the kind of person that has to have your whatchamacallit or you can't do the case. If you, if you are one of those, then you either need to make sure the hospital has your whatchamacallit or you need to actually not, or, or tell them you're just not going to get privileges for that case. It helps to be a little bit of a... I don't know, country bumpkin kind of doc, like you can take out a pancreas with a spoon 
Um, I mean, you know, I've been put into situations where I was appalled at the lack of equipment that I had available to me and you need to, you can't get mad. You need to do the case and get mad later. Um, so I, I just want to put that plug out there. I've been put in some really unbelievably poorly stocked ORs. Flexibility and adaptability are very important if you want to be a locums doc. I, I know Dr. Patel has mentioned that there's some things that you actually bring with you on assignment just in case. Maybe talk a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, with, um, with COVID coming and, you know, in the emergency rooms, I learned this issue of, um, I wouldn't say distrust. I would just say, just prepare yourself. It's easier as an ER physician, I think, than as a surgeon. But um, I learned back when I started doing locums, I mean, you know, I have my own video scope. Um, I have, I just bought the, and I don't have any financial interest in Butterfly, but I did buy a Butterfly IQ, which is phenomenal. It's a portable ultrasound. I can connect to my phone. I can save everything on HIPAA compliant cloud. Um, I have just things that I use a lot. I get a lot of finger trauma and um, I have like ring tourniquets temporarily stop the bleeding so that I can do the repair. Um, I have like LMAs, just airway devices. And now with COVID, um, I, we just, I don't even complain or fuss anymore. I don't expect my hospitals. I don't even know what their situations can be, but I just, we have our own N95s. We have our own face shields. We have goggles. We just have it all ready so that when the situation arises now, it's not, it's not an issue. Um, so in that sense, um, you just like Dr. Pellegrini was saying, you walk in and, oh, sorry, the anesthesia took your glidoscope, or sorry, the fiber optics isn't working right now. Or, the ultrasound machine is from this company and it's been broken for six months. And I've just, uh, I'm trying to live these days more calm and less angry. And so I feel like if I'm just prepared, that it's not really that much of an issue <laughs> anymore. So, um, so it's worked out nicely. Great, great attitude goes, goes a long <laughs> way. Um, you, you mentioned uh, kind of the COVID-19 environment. Uh, we got a question here, kind of what is the effect of COVID-19 um, on locums opportunities? And uh, especially with downsizing trends happening uh, with emergency medicine. What, do you, what are you seeing out there? I kind of alluded to, uh, to it at the beginning. Um, I think um, we've, uh, I could never imagine that we would be for load, but um, I've had hospitals that we contract with do locums at that have uh, for load us temporarily. Now, um, you know, you have to always separate out, you know, the clinical side of medicine. I don't really do anything administrative. I'm just a community doc that does part-time academics, but um, I think the financial people have their viewpoint on things. We as clinicians have our viewpoint. We're all trying to do the right thing together, um, but with low volumes and elective surgery cases being canceled, their argument can be that their revenues are down. Now, that means understaffing or um, an ER is, is, is hard because you're going day by day, but you never know what could happen the next day. And so being understaffed in an emergency room, that's very critical, which you're doing a lot of things. You may have a general surgeon, an OB, and an ortho orthopod, and that's pretty much your backup there. Um, so we've dealt with those in the cases we've seen where the volumes have been up or have been COVID hot areas, like New Orleans, New York. Um, I know Michigan had a lot of need, um, but we've unfortunately seen volumes down, staffing has come down. And I think with that, a lot of um, local physicians are, are uh, kind of hurting a little bit um, for work. I have this next week for load. Um, so I'm just doing you know useless home improvement projects like the rest of America right now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it hasn't, I think it started out earlier, the, the need was higher in hot areas. And as things are somewhat stabilizing in the COVID hot zones, I think the need is down, but um, some of our hospitals are bringing us back. So I think with Texas reopening, the volumes are coming up again is my guess. But I would, I would argue to everybody that if you get for load, I wouldn't take it personally. I think it's usually either out of the control of your medical director or whoever. Um, and in due time, because what we worry about in the emergency room, we worry, it's not the volumes we worry about. We worry about where are all the heart attacks and strokes and people go. Our county hospital, we see over a hundred thousand a year, close to a hundred thousand. Uh, they didn't just all disappear and get cured. So where are dialysis patients getting dialysis? And so I think the volumes will pick up. People are just afraid. 
um, to use the ER. Uh, but as education gets better and things get better, I think it will come back. Great. Uh, what are you seeing out there, Dr. Pellegrini? Well, I'm in an unusual position in that even though I'm a surgeon and my OR shut down on March 16, I'm also double boarded as a critical care person. So I have been outrageously busy um, covering uh, COVID IC surge ICUs through Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And so I've actually had to say no to a, you know assignments so that I could just get home and have a couple of days off. I've worked harder in the last two months than I think I've ever done. So I'm in a weird position from that standpoint. Very, very lucky, you know, because once COVID dies down, then my OR hopefully will be open and I can start operating. Yeah, definitely. I, I think so. I think the short answer is uh, job volume has definitely been impacted in the short term, but hopefully in the coming months as uh, states reopen more, as elective care returns, as patients feel more comfortable to return to hospitals, um, we'll see the job volume pick back up across, across all specialties. Um, uh, one other follow-up question about malpractice, um, liability. Uh, any recommendations about best malpractice or liability insurance? Um, I think for me, I, I really just go with what they offer. Um, if we're not using an agency, we use the malpractice the hospital provides and the medical school here in Houston has their own malpractice. And then the agents, Comp Health and Weatherby have their own. And that's pretty much it, yeah, for what, what we use. I don't really get as much um, selection. Um, I've asked, um, I did ask, um, I forgot when this was about, if you get sued above your malpractice limit. Um, I spoke to a few attorneys. I don't have, I'm not, I'm not a healthcare attorney, but I was told that it's very rare in our specialty um, to get sued above your limit. And if people find out you have additional coverage beyond that, they will then go after that money. So basically my point when I was told, and that may be changing now, but I was told the, the limits I've been provided are generally sufficient that I've had. I'm not going to I haven't had any malpractice litigation yet, but, um, but yeah. Anything to add? No, I, I honestly don't pay much attention to it. Um, I just know whether being comp health have it. And then if the hospital covers me, I, I just, I haven't worked in any hospital that I thought was going to go bankrupt. Um, haven't had any major lawsuits. So, um, I've ha I mean, I was named in a couple and then released, so I don't have a lot of experience, um, which is, I consider myself lucky <laughs> considering what yeah. I do. I feel like it's got to happen to me at some point. Yeah, yeah in the same way. It's, uh, I'm sure it's inevitable, especially in our, I think we say one every five to seven years, I think. So I'm sure it's down the pipeline. Um, it's just inevitable. But um, yeah, I, mean, I don't pay much attention to what the actual carrier is. But it is good, I think, to have a, a bigger, if you're with a big agency that will be able to support you and back you if, if things come to that. Yeah, I, I think the important thing is just to be educated and uh, you know, do some research about what type of coverage they have, make sure they have tail coverage, um, see the quality of, of, the, uh, of the policy as well. You can look at different ratings. Um, we're, gonna, we're, we're at 50 minutes, so uh, maybe we can start to wrap up. Um, so I think a lot of the people who are attending this haven't done locums, they're thinking about it. What advice would you each give to, uh, to a physician or a PA or MP considering locums for the first time? Um, I guess I kind of like Dr. Pellegrini was saying, I completely agree. try it out. Um, you know, you don't have to jump in full time, but maybe do, and this is exactly what I tell, um, my residents is start it out part time, see how you like it, see how you like the kind of the travel the location, constantly meeting you people working in different environments. And if you like it, get, maybe get another gig, um, and see how that works with your schedule, your freedom, and, um, and then go from there. Um, but try, it's definitely, it's, I encourage people to try it. Cause I know when I was in residency, I, I didn't have any clue what other options existed aside from working with the big contract management company, um, which is what Houston pretty much has now. And thank God I started doing local, for, for a lot of reasons, thank God I started doing locums, but Houston now is completely um, overrun by the, the big um, staffing companies. Um, 
team health and vision, but it's also very saturated now, highly saturated, because we have a lot of freestanding emergency rooms that unfortunately closed. And so having that option of locums in different states has kind of helped me also just through the job market. I never thought I'd say that, um, but the bigger cities do tend to get saturated. Um, so try it out, talk to somebody who's done it and see who they use, what their experience was like and, um, and see how it goes and go from there. It's definitely not for everybody, but um, I think there's a lot of pros to it for people that want more freedom in their practice, freedom in their lifestyle. And I mean, to me, most importantly is practicing medicine under my own terms. I'm trying to be perfect in a very, very imperfect healthcare environment right now. What about you, Dr. Pellegrini? What, what advice would you have? Well, I'm very pro doing locums, um, just like Dr. Patel. And I, the other thing uh, that I want to mention is I think it makes you a better physician, especially if you've been working in one place for decades. You get used to one way of doing things. So when I go into a new hospital, there's new policies, there's new flow patterns, and some are better than what I've seen. Some are worse, but it, it just makes you a better physician to be exposed to, to that. So even if you have no intention of ever leaving your job and you love your job, do a couple of weeks of locums a year, get out, get, get, you know, get exposed to what's going on um, outside of your hospital system. It, it will make you a better physician. Uh, I think yeah. Those are great pieces of advice. Uh, any, any parting words as we end? Um, I think that's really great advice. I, you know, my colleagues that may complain about this hospital or that hospital, I'm like, you have no idea how good you have it here, man. Like you have, you are overstaffed. You've got this like Rolls Royce of equipment here. And um, yeah, yeah, I think it just, I totally agree with that. It just makes you a better physician. I've just been much more happy um, with my own practice and the care I'm able to provide um, to my patients in really parts of the country where they can't really get um, board trained physicians to move out there or to live there. And the patients I think are immensely grateful, grateful for, for what you're doing for them. Well, great, thank you so much for your time today. We, uh, we really appreciate having you both on. Um, if we uh, if we have any other questions that we weren't able to answer, um, we can uh, we'll probably post this on a blog and we can potentially answer those on the blog post when that comes out. We're recording all this. Um, we'll send this out to everyone who attended. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to try to do these every month or so and do a different topic. Um, so keep posted. We'll keep posted, and we'll uh, we'll hopefully see you all again in the future. Thanks again. All right, great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.